a marriage, uh, along with the many benefits and positives that marriage brings into one's life, there are struggles and hard work. This is a reason why much reward has been promised when marrying. Some factors that cause the breakdown of marriage. Look, for the, I'll just read them. I've already mentioned some things. Number one, I've gathered 10 or 12. I once did a couple of talks on this where one day we talked about six and the other six. Number one, s- s- these are the basic causes that break up marriages and result in divorce. Number one, what I've just been talking about. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Not understanding and appreciate the opposite gender can cause problems in marriage. Therefore, learn and appreciate the inherent physical, psychological, temperamental differences between men and women. When the husband and wife are able to accept and understand the differences between the two genders, disputes will be less. They won't go away completely. Less. And love has a chance to blossom. So understanding, not knowing before, that's why, you know, before we get married and our youngsters and our youth get married, maybe doing these courses where you sit them down and teach them the differences between the two genders. Because in normal cases, which is good, that a boy will always only be hanging around with men. His mates are all men. You've got a youngster, he's all his friends. Now, when he gets married, sometimes the first time you come across living with a woman. You don't know how to deal with a woman. With your mate. You, you know, if he said something, you just punch him one. Oh, yeah, on the back. Yeah. Here, you're going to punch your wife, she's going to hurt her for like the next two weeks. And if he, even if he doesn't, she'll still tell you he hurts her. And you might say something to a man, which the man won't take much notice of. But for her... It's like she's very sensitive. She will remind you when you've got four grandkids that in back in 1973, it was 3 a.m. and you said this to me. It's different. So really need to teach men and women the differences. The man needs to be told that women, how they think about things, how they deal about things, how they talk, how they converse. There's a lot of majaz. If you study usul al-fiqh, there's a lot of majaz fi kalam nisa And a lot of haqiqa fi kalam rijal If your wife says to you, you never take me out to eat, which means, can we please go today? That's what it means. You never take me out. Now, you're gonna, if you don't understand this, you're going to argue, but I took you last week. No, you never take me out. I took you two, three weeks ago. You never take me out. Just say, just change it. You never take me out means it would be nice to go probably this week. All right, understood. This is majaz, metaphorical. You've never, ever done this. She doesn't mean never, ever. Her never, ever is like it's been three weeks. (laughs) This is all majaz. And likewise, women need to understand men. When the man is gone quiet, doesn't mean he's going to stab you. He comes back and he's not talking. Doesn't mean that that's it, he's found another second wife. He comes, he's tired, or oh, some issue and he doesn't talk to you. for, his, for his, then just, That's how men are. They just go in a room, just stay quiet. He'll come back, don't worry. Men go into these some phrases that uh, they don't just want that. Doesn't mean that that's it. So the woman, if she doesn't understand, then she thinks, Oh, he's not talking to me. Is he upset with me? Has he found a second wife? Or is he going to give me talaq? Or is there something wrong? Relax. This is really important, not just Islamically, but we need this gender role, you know, um, gender differences, uh, education. Number two, this is an extension, which is gender roles are mixed up, which I was talking about. Men should remain men, women should remain women. Sadly, many divorces, separations, disputes occur because gender roles have been mixed up. In a community where feminism is rife, divorce rates are on the increase. Allah made a man masculine, a woman feminine, perfect, perfect, you know, like a companionship and a perfect jigsaw puzzle. Perfect, man, masculine, feminine. But now, in the West, specifically, but even other parts of the world, the man, like I say this as a joke, I say that Allah made a man masculine and a woman feminine, and you had a perfect marriage of 
someone who's masculine, someone who's feminine. But now the man has become half feminine and the woman has become half masculine. So rather than having a masculine marrying a feminine, you've got a half masculine, half feminine marrying a half masculine, half feminine. And that's why we have a clash. If not half, then at least we've all been affected slightly because of the culture we're living in. So if it's not 50%, we, it's very rare for all of us to have 100% masculinity. We'll be affected 5%, 5 because it's difficult because that's how the society is. And likewise, the women living in these societies, they'll have some sort of masculinity and feminism and that harshness. and some, They won't be that really submissive, submissive. Maybe the eastern countries, I don't know, in some villages. But now even in those places, things are difficult. So, it's difficult, but you know, this is something we need to work upon. Gender roles. Also, like understanding that, look, responsibility of earning is the man's. That's a gender role. Women can work, it's not haram, but that's not her main role. Nafaqa is in the, on, on the man. The role of the man is different to the role of the woman. Allah has created men and women differently. That doesn't mean one is better than the other. There's equality, but not similarity. Allah made the man and the woman, and he knows what are the, uh, the, the strength of the man and the weaknesses of the man, and he knows the strengths and weaknesses of the woman. And according to the strengths and weaknesses, he gave certain things, roles and tasks and responsibilities to the man and certain things to the woman. I'll give an example for this as well, but we'll leave it, there's no time. I'll give an example of a bodybuilder and a, you know, a very clever person. Like basically, if, if, you've got, if you've got a workplace and you've got a lot of, th you know, you've got an office and you work, you, you've got a lot of things need to be done, You've got all this labor work, furniture and big, big boxes that need to be taken upstairs and put into the second floor and a lot of labor work. And you've also got a lot of accounts that you need to sort out. And you need to do all of this yourself and you're tired and, you know, suddenly two friends come inside and say, Assalamu alaikum, how are you? We both thought that, you know what, we'll come and help you for the day. Any, anything, any khidma? You say, Alhamdulillah, sent two angels. Ni'ma ghair mutaraqqaba. This is without anticipating Allah sent this. Alhamdulillah. One of your friends is strong, bodybuilder, muscle, muscle man, muscle man. Very, very, you know, mashallah. He's very healthy. But he's not sharp in the head. He's doing too much bodybuilding that he lost all his brains as well. But he's not really intelligent, sharp. He's not studied much by it. The other one is like a stick. You blow at him and he falls down. He's very, you know, and, you know, it's like no strength, no power, but the guy's a genius. He's got a degree in mathematics and all sorts. Now you say, oh, okay, okay, yeah, uh, I've got two things to do. What's the logical way? You tell the strong guy to take the boxes and do the labor work and this guy to do your accounts. What about if you do it the opposite way around? You tell the guy who's really clever, can you pick all these boxes and tell the guy who's a bodybuilder, but no brain. Can you do all my accounts? That's reversing the roles. So if someone asks which one's better, no one's better than the other. Both of them have something that the other one doesn't have. Man or woman better, both of them have something that the other one doesn't have. Each gender is good in something. According to that, Allah said, the man, you are, you know, you supposed to go out, you're supposed to earn, and the wife, you're not supposed to earn, or, you, or the responsibility of earning is not on you. So this is the gender roles. Number three, people enter marriages with too much, high, too much and too high expectations. Sadly, this is full, fueled by the internet and watching too many Bollywood movies. My Prince Charming will come and he's going to pick me up and you know, we're going to happily ever live, happily ever after. And, Oh, this, you know, superficial world that people live in. And then they get married and then they face reality. Oh, I have to change nappies now. And, you know, I have to do this and that. There's too much high expectations. This causes problems in the marriage. Number four, some men have an immature attitude despite being married. And they want to live a bachelor lifestyle. This can cause problems. They want to stay with their friends having shisha until 1 a.m. and It's going to cause problems. You're married now. Finish. You can't do all that kind of stuff. 
Now you need to spend your time with your family. Another reason is also outside interference. Family members, friends can be detrimental. Let them live their life. Sometimes people interfering, others can give sincere advice, but they should let the couple deal with the issues themselves. And that's why in a marriage, if you have problems, don't pick up the phone and speak to your parents for every small... So my husband didn't smile at me today. My husband didn't do this at me. No, every small problem. And, oh, she didn't cook for me, or she didn't do this for me. You complain to your mother about every small thing, or your dad. Deal with it. These are, you become mature. Don't let other people, unless it gets critical, then you get others involved. But in normal cases, another reason is expectation from in-laws, but I've already explained that. And the main kind of reason is this. Marriage... Many marriages break down due to the lack of tazkiyah. I think that's probably the main bad character. Non-reformed hearts, misuse of the tongue, no taqwa, no God consciousness. Until both spouses do not have reformed hearts, they have not worked on their hearts, on the spiritual diseases like jealousy and hatred and enmity and showing off and ostentation and pride and arrogance. And they do not fear Allah in their hearts. And they don't have taqwa and accountability in the hereafter. It is difficult to fulfill each other's rights. The couple should make everything about seeking Allah's pleasure. Put once They should try to put their spouse before their own selves. Number eight, love of dunya. Being a materialistic person. Obsession with wealth. Money issues. Comparing marriages. Oh, my friend's husband takes her to holiday every year. When are you going to take me to holiday? Oh, he brings her shoes and handbags. When are you going to bring me handbags? You're comparing. Being materialistic. A, remember, a marriage based solely on money, solely on money, can never be prosperous. Number nine is, I've already talked about it, is all these, you know, khubth. In, I've already talked about this, you know, porn addiction, fornication, free casual intermingling with opposite gender, Masturbation, glancing at unlawful things, dressing inappropriately, all of these things have within marriage has a negative impact on marriage. You have to live a pure lifestyle. If they are married but they're not dressing modestly, then of course these things are all going to contribute negatively. So these are nine, nine things which really, I've just done it very quickly. Each one I can talk about is like 45 minutes on each of these points. Yeah, all of them I've spoken before, one one hour each of these points. I have most of them I've spoken one one hour in a lot of depth and detail. I just there's no time. But there's these are nine things that we can do something about them. We can treat and manage. There's the tenth one that is beyond our control. And that's when divorce is can be no compatibility. That's not in our control. Allah has made people despite trying all of this. Sometimes there's just no chemistry. This is where you work before marriage and try to find out from your family, friends. But you can end up being married to someone where you just are two completely different mentally, psychologically, emotionally. There's too much differences. There's no compatibility whatsoever. It's really different. Forget men from Mars, women from Venus. It's just Pluto and beyond. Down under. So, therefore, for this, you need to try to make a well-informed choice from before. But still, if you end up, then if you do sabr, alhamdulillah, but if you can't, then Islam has got something which is called divorce and separation, and that's not also haram. And in certain cases, it permits it. As a last resort, you can resort to divorce. But that divorce should also be with ihsan. And then here I have a whole discussion, next part, it says divorce, separation, some fiqh of divorce, uh, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so, but we'll end here, inshallah ta'ala. We can do some bit of quick here. Anyway. Any questions, inshallah, from the female side? If they could uh, pass it on in writing. Or 
Yeah, uh, panel of this one. Um, what's the tasawwur um, of joint family, well, the joint family system in Islam? And apart from it obviously being permissible with its conditions, um, like, I'm more inclined towards like the concept of hijab ma maintaining, in fact, we have an article regarding this and in fact how you do leniency regarding not covering the face for the woman in the joint family system while taking care of other means but like in terms of sitting together in one dining table or being in one lounge yet being restrictive so what's your opinion of this? There's two aspects of what you've asked the second part is the main way you've asked not about, you know, should there be joint families, what's better, what's not better. That's not the main topic, yeah? Because yeah. these are two different, two, there's two, three different questions in that one question. Um, like I'll try to answer all three. In terms of what Islam says, should you have a joint family or not, there's no such a thing that you must or you, sh or you shouldn't or you should. It's, it depends on people. It's, it's permissible, it depends what you want to do. Basic condition is that a wife does have a basic Islamic right to have a separate cooking area, and a separate sleeping, living uh, area and bathroom area. That's her basic right if she wants. If, if you get married and the wife says that I want, an, even if it's within the same house, but I've got a separate area where my cooking food and my uh, bathroom area and my room to sleep is separate from everybody else, then that's her basic, you have to give that. That's her basic right. That's her basic right. But if she says, no, I don't mind, then no problem. Now, it just depends. Some cultures, people are better collectively, some places. It just depends. It depends a lot what's better. So, in some cases, it's actually better for people to live separately. Some places, some communities. Mawlana Shri Tanwi Rahmanullah used to advise, actually, that you could just live separately because it causes... But some people, that the way the whole family system is, maybe their akhlaq and things are so amazing that they can live together. Some people are like that. There, there are some people who just, just people are so good that, you know, it's, very, it's, it's possible for them to. So it just depends. So anyway, that's that part. Um, as for this fiqh issue, of course, the hijab rules do apply. In a, because there's people who are not mahram. Even first cousins, as when they grow older, Cousin, if people can get married to one another, so there's hijab rules. Cousin, brother, cousin, sister, there's hijab rules. And also, your, you know, your, say, your, for example, your sister's husband, a woman, or, or, or your brother's wife. Alham, al maut. The Prophet said, Alham al maut. So, the ba and like you said, I've written an article and I've given a bit of leniency. And this is not from myself, the leniency, it's from Mufita Qusmani, from Dalam Karachi. The leniency is that, look, the face covering, you see the point here is that we've misunderstood hijab in our communities. We have this word parda, we think the be all and end all is parda, everyone just uses the word parda. We've misunderstood. In Islam, there's, there's, there's no concept of just parda, there's, that's not an Islamic thing. And I've explained the article, in, in Islam, we have something called the laws of hijab. One is the hijab, the head cover, that's metaphorically said it. But we have what we call the laws, the laws of hijab, which means there are a collection of laws prescribed by Islam, by Sharia, a collection of rules, yes, collection which have been prescribed for both men and women, for both women and men. Some of them are for men, some are for women. In order for a respectful separation between the two genders. That's the definition of hijab. What is hijab again? A collection of laws, rules, prescribed for women and men in order for a respectful separation between the two genders. Now, what's the collection of laws? Number one, don't be naked. Cover your body. Number two, cover your aura. What's the aura of a woman? The whole body except face, hands and feet. What's the aura of the man between the navel and the knees? 
cover the aura with loose clothing, not tight clothing, not see-through clothing. Number four, don't speak and talk in for, informally. No casual talking, not, no joking around, no, no you know, extra free conversation. Be very formal in the way you talk with anyone who's not your mahram, men and women. No joking around. Of course, no skin-to-skin -skin contact, touching, no shaking hands. Whoever's not your gender, uh, whoever's not your mahram, sorry. These are all muttafaq. Also, yeah, of course, no khalwa. Being alone in the house. Khalwa, haram, basic. These are all muttafaq ali agreed upon rules. Not applying too much perfume. This is more specifically for the woman. Is the ta'tarat al mar'atu. She shouldn't apply too much perfume or go in the presence of a non muharam man. These are all clear, 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 clear agreed upon. No casual, free in talking. Okay? Now, these are the main ones. After that, there are one or two others, but they're disagreed upon. They're not qat'i, they're not absolute. Like being in the same hall or room. Of course, not alone. But lots of men and lots of women or lots of other people, but being just there. That's not an actual rule of hijab or a qat'i rule. That's like sudden is the ri'ah. So for example, if, we're, if there's, four, there's three, four of us brothers sitting here, that, near that wall there's three, four sisters sitting there. Just being, there's no centimeters. That, oh, can I see how many meters you're away from? Okay, five centimeters. You have to be, there's no rule that you have to be four meters away from a woman. Otherwise, no one's coming to Australia in the plane. People say to me, mixed gatherings. I said, do you go in the plane? There's a lot of mixed gatherings in the plane. It'll, it'll be haram to sit in a plane. It'll be haram to travel in a train. It'll be haram to go in any restaurant because there's women on other tables. You can't walk. Is it like you can't walk in a street that a woman is walking? I am breathing the same air as a woman is breathing the same air. I, I can't be in the street. So there's no such a thing about distance. You can't be close and touch her, but there's no distance issue. That's not a rule of hijab. That rule, when we say that let's have a separation, like if you have a program, yes, sisters are, why are they not here? It's more of a secondary saddan li dhari'a ruling. So that it doesn't lead to the first list I mentioned. Because we can't trust each other. One of us might start flirting with her. We might start, you know, talking casually, freely with her. Or someone might put too much perfume. Or somebody might just expose a hair or talking. So because of to block the means to those real hijab rules, that has been everything should be in its place. Likewise, the face cover. Face cover is not qat'i. There's a difference of opinion. The opinion that many of our teachers follow, I follow, and is that yes, in normal cases, niqab face cover is wajib. But it's not a qat'i ruling. There's a valid difference of opinion. Valid, valid, valid. Difference of opinion. Now, whenever there is something that there's difference of opinion, valid difference of opinion, it's not a qat'i ruling, and that can become relaxed in certain scenarios. In certain scenarios. When, for example, look, this is all, you have darura level, you have hajj, I've explained that as well. So you have a darura level, which is absolute necessity, where you're dying out of hunger and thirst. Even the absolute haram becomes halal. You can eat pork to save your life. But the second is where it's not absolute, it's just a bit of hardship, like Hajj, for example. You know, sometimes, you know, some sisters, they go, if you're doing this, alhamdulillah, do it. I'm not discouraging you, but, I mean, in my case, I wouldn't, like my family members, I would just tell them to take the niqab off. Because you've got to wear a cap, and it's hot, it's hot and you're touching, and you can't let the niqab touch your face, and you're falling down. It's, people have, you know, fallen down and things like that. Whoever comes down there to do Hajj and ride down there, no one's checking your face out. I just people are in their own world, so just for a moment during ihram and things like that, it's very difficult. So because of mashakka, even if you follow the rule that you have to wear a niqab, if it's mashakka, so from this angle, Dalun Karachi gave the fatwa that if you're living in a joint system, this mashakka, you normally cover your face, 
but here every time you know you've got brother-in-law or, or cousin brother and it's like living in a house with a niqab it's like living with covid 24 7. you've got a mask on your face 24 7. it's not easy to have your face covered all the time in your house outside the house inside the house so therefore as long but remember as long as the full face is properly covered as long as the other rules are acted upon, like no flirty conversation, no free casual conversation, being no khalwa, those are the main rules. And this is the khulasa of this, basically. This is why they said this. Now, people don't get all these things, you know, I have to explain, or, you know, they say, oh, but they don't, are they saying, not do parda? One word, parda. But there's hundreds of, there's another list there. It's not just, for some communities, they, think the whole of hijab rules in, is in one face niqab. Everything else, there'll be women who wear the niqab, but they'll violate that whole list. Behind the niqab, she'll say, how are you, and everything, and all the flirting goes on. So what's the point of doing the niqab if the other main rules are not acted upon? So this is how people need to understand what are the rules of hijab. I wrote all of this in the article there, Ajit. It's been a long time, I can't remember, but I try to explain all of this in more detail. So you're saying there's, there's a then you talked about how there's no what's it called, measurement to say that this much to stay away is wide. And then if there's ihtiyat, because I've talked to a mufti that works in Dawr, if they say that ihtiyat, yeah. Ihtiyat, then He's... gunjaish mil jati, yeah. When there's what? When there's ihtiyat done regarding yeah. fitna, to print gunjaish, yeah. ek hat tak mil jati. Yeah, like it, because this ruling is based on, you know, like I said, it's a secondary loop blocking the means, it's for precaution. So in precaution, if rules are there for precaution, then you get that gunjaish, you get that flexibility uh, when there's a need. And then that depends on every scenario. Like if you think that there's a, in my situation, there's a fear of fitna, then, ev- then is, this is where the hadith says, istafti qalbak. That's where your heart becomes a mufti. These are kind of things like you, you have to judge the scenario. If someone's situation is like in our, my case here, I don't know, you know, it's, we fear fitna, then you just, yeah, bring it a bit closer. There's definitely a rule that the voice is not aura. <laughs> Women can hear your voice. It's not aura. That's 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 agreed upon ruling. So don't worry. Okay. So the uh, suggestion he gave us, like uh, especially for um, uh, one of the steps that the, the husband had to do. And so that uh, the marriage life is, uh, I think uh, it's going to be better. So, once we identify the problem issue I have, then what is the where I could improve? So, where I could improve? Like, is the, like with the physical, when we get disease or illness, you can easily find GP and doctors everywhere. But why? Um, we need to solve this issue because marriage that is not, uh, it's a regular day to day basis. So, how do we solve this issue? Well, if you see a problem, then how do you solve it? Yeah. So, so, like 10, 10 items you discussed, like having to do this, or do the these other things, do, we all got shortcomings, shortcomings, I got shortcomings, I need to overcome this, like how do we overcome? Once we identify the problem, now how do we overcome this problem? Or it should solve this problem? Depends. I mean, there's no one answer to that. It depends what kind of problem it is. Sometimes you might need some advice from somebody else. Sometimes it's just your own. You, if you know, you, willpower, you have to change it yourself. That's it. Isn't, like I kept on saying, there's no magic potion. So I know that I need to, for example, uh, not be selfish. Now, what's a, I can't go to a shop to buy selfish, selflessness. How much does it cost? Okay, I have to travel. Give me a packet of self, selflessness. Okay, here's 10 pounds. Give me selflessness. So I have to so work. I have to. That's it. There's no, nothing comes easy. Man jadda wajad. We have to try. We've identi- we identify the reasons, and then we just have to put in the effort. Yes, yeah, some dua. Lo- look, dua is very powerful. Making lots of dua to Allah. We should never, never forget dua. Along with all of these things, dua to Allah. Constant dua. Maybe the husband and wife should every day just sit and make dua together. That you know all these problems in marriage, Allah help us. You know that we can avoid them and things like that, and make our marriage better. It's a good thing. Sometimes you might just need some advice from somebody or something, or like you've got an issue, you can go to third, you know, some third party that this problem is there, help an imam or something like that. So it just depends on the situation.
Yeah, we'll just end with that one, yeah? So the question was, uh, two parts to it, is that one, uh, can husband stop the wife from working? And second part was that if the wife is working, can husband have this agreement with the wife that whatever you earn, for example, 50% would be ours or house or his? In the first case, yes, he can stop. Second case, he can't put that condition. A simple answer. He, he can't say that whatever you earn, 50%, no. A woman, whatever is, is hers, is hers. The husband cannot put any condition. If she wants to give happily, then fine. If, she, if you marry a millionaire who's got a millionaire from inheritance of a father, she doesn't have to give one dollar to you or spend anything in the house. You still have to provide it. So you can't put that condition that if you work, you have to give 50%, no. But yeah, the first part, the husband has a right, and this is like, basically that's his right. If he says you can't work, then submissive wife will be saying, okay, I can't work. He makes the decision. So he does have a right. So this is the connection, basically. If he allows, then you can't say put this condition that you have to give me half. If you don't want that, then just don't allow from the beginning. You have that right. But these things, like I said, you know, it should be mutual kind of agreement, you know, just whatever. You try to be understanding and try to solve it in the best of ways. Um, whatever's good for both parties. Rather than, you know, make, making a big fight out of it that, okay, you know, I'm not letting you work. And so, yeah, why do you want to work? Maybe say, look, if you need, I'll be there to provide anything. Or if you just want your mind to be refreshed or something, you could do something voluntary or something small. You know, for one hour or something like that. Just mutual understanding. What women need to understand is not to feel that they're somehow missing something in life or they are backward just, or they are medieval time women just because they're not working or they're looking after their children. There is no greater chore, there's no greater job role work than being a mother. I once tweeted this, don't let society tell you you're backwards by staying at home. This is the greatest, greatest, greatest role a woman can play. Be happy. I say to the woman, like, why do you want to go and work? A classic, a classic example of a per, you know, perfect life. You just wake up in the morning, Fajr Salah, make your adhkar, everything. Your husband struggling, okay, give, make a nice breakfast, have with the family, all the children, everybody. You all go to school, you go work, you go back to sleep, relax. You had nice, have a nice shower, everything, wake up 10, 10.30, put your feet up, go in the garden, make yourself a cup of coffee, tea, just relax, clean the house a bit, you know, then maybe the other sister who's also not working across, you know, go to a house or she comes to the house, go and sit in the, go to the park, walk around in the, in the park for a bit. If you've got some really small children, maybe take them out, relax, enjoy, go and have some coffee, Be you know, Melbourne coffee, subhanAllah, the best coffee. I want that coffee again, by the way. <laughs> I've missed it for two days It's an amazing coffee that I think the best coffee I've had um, So Then come back home Then prepare Make some food Get the food ready Everything Then all the kids are coming Husband coming Eating What a beautiful life Everything taken care of You don't have to worry about anything why do they want to run outside and career-minded? I want to work, I want to work, I want to do this, I want to do this. Why? I don't get it. It's like this society has put this in the brain of the woman, thinking you're somehow less of a woman, less of a human being. Mufti Taqr Usmani Hafizullah gives this example that this society has said such that if a woman was to stay at home, cook, serve a husband, children, family, the society tells her that you're what? backward. If the same woman goes and becomes a hostess and serves 200 men, that's now progression, being progressive. 200 men who are checking you out from head to toe and treating you like a slave. And if you look at the history of how women were pulled into the world, into the workplace, it's all, this is all men. You know, if you look at the history, because back in the day women never used to, even non-Muslims, they never used to work. The men... They, they thought to themselves, there's two reasons. One was they were bored. You know, the men 
you know, just men working, they have they had no motivation. They wanted women there to look forward to going to work. In the morning, oh, I was going to work. Oh, but there'll be that secretary and there'll be that one. And be, oh, she will be there and flirt with that one. So this is one of the reasons they took the woman out of the house. And number two, they wanted help like of the other gender to because the work was only the men were doing so they wanted they were getting like there's too much work load let's get drag the woman out of the house as well and let her do the woman was deceived by the man oh your equality is be like the man be like the man be like the man but even though she come you know you've got a family the man and the woman both are working still the household stuff the woman is doing a woman is working as much or as close to what the man is working, but still she cooks more, she cleans more, she does the breastfeeding, she does most of the thing at home, she look, brings up the children more. So it wasn't that, you know, her responsibilities here were taken up by the man, no. So this woman who had a relaxed life, she was told to do a lot of these things, like she, you know, outside the house, she still has to do the house thing. And this is the woman today we've got. She's working. She's running around like a chicken everywhere. She has to go and do the school run. She has to come and clean as well. She has to come and cook as well. She has to do the house stuff. She has to do outside stuff. She will be depressed. Why wouldn't she be depressed? That's why they all go through depression. Of course she's going to be depressed. There's too much on her plate. And she can't manage it. And then it's frustration. And then there's marriage problems. This is, this is, we need to understand this. I, I don't know how, I mean, I'm very strong on this. The woman should just, queen of the house. Just stay and relax. As we say in England, chill. Just relax. You don't have to worry about nothing. Khair, inshallah. I have a question. Uh, some lady they do child care. They learn child care and how to do it. And they leave their children. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad, yeah. Someone has sad. They're caring of the child of everybody else, children of other people, but they forget yeah. their children, own children. And I don't know what to do. I want to do change, like change, changing the nephews about. Yeah, the same thing that they will do child care and they'll go and look after all the other children and forget their own children. It's like their children and then giving it to someone else. So everyone's doing child care of other people's children. Just do your own children. But look, having said this, it's not haram. No, we're not saying it's haram for a woman to work. There are examples, sometimes needed. Some, but another thing is that we have big expectations of life, lifestyle. So that's another thing. Some people say, but in this day and age, you have to work. Otherwise, you're not able to manage your life. Well, you might have to downgrade. <coughs> do you want a house or do you want a home? Do you want a house or do you want a home? Do you want peace or do you want money? You can have peace and money, but if it's between the two, stay in a smaller house, go less holidays, you know, have a small, small hut, sleep on the floor. I'm sure people can manage a good, small home, you know, very simple home, but love and peace and tranquility is better than having a mansion that your, your wife lives on the fourth floor and you're on the bottom floor and you never, you WhatsApp each other. <laughs> somebody said this once so we've got a massive it's like she's on the other side of the house and we just communicate with whatsapp or something like anyway inshallah